，富豪 ，Maiden of Yue， 木兰 ，Princess Pingyang。These are just a few names among the long list of warrior women in Chinese history and literature. In the West, Mulan may be the best known among them, but to be honest, there are plenty other kick-ass ladies out there. So on this episode, I will talk about how the warrior women archetype became so prevalent in China, and was Mulan just a drop in the bucket, or is there an X factor that makes her story unique compared to the others? The earliest recorded warrior woman in Chinese history was Fu Hao, the consort of King Wu Ding of Song Dynasty, who lived over 3,000 years ago. According to records, she successfully led the king's army to battle and defeated various hostile states. Her rank in the military was only second after the king himself, and the large amount of weaponry found in her tomb is a testament of her martial prowess. Then, in the fifth century BCE, we have the Maiden of Yue, the martial arts trainer of King Gaojian's army, and probably the first Xia Nu, or the Wuxia heroine archetype. Like many other civilizations, ancient China was also a patriarchal society, but records of women commanders and stories of female martial arts masters are a dime a dozen in Chinese history and fiction. In fact, I used to be quite confused why people in the West are so attached to Mulan. Because there were just plenty more out there. In virtually every dynasty in Chinese history, there are stories of remarkable women warriors, such as Lü Mu, the deadliest tiger mom in history. She raised an army and launched an uprising against the Xing Dynasty because a magistrate executed her son. The list is just too long. Someone could start a whole channel just talking about them, and there would be years of content. So in this video, I will just mention the famous ones briefly and analyze the two main women warrior archetypes. One of them is the female commanders, and the other one are the female martial arts master, Xia Nu. Female commanders are usually found in recorded history because obviously they lead armies and their impact was recorded by the literary elites. In the Jing Dynasty, there was Xun Guan. The daughter of a governor who led a group of soldiers to defend a city at 13 years old, Princess Pingyang, who helped her father establish the Tang Dynasty, Liang Hongyu, who bought herself out of slavery and then defended the Song Dynasty against the Jurchens with her husband, Qin Liangyu, was the wife of a chieftain who defended the Ming Dynasty against the Manchu. The common thread here is that usually their authority to lead an army comes from their privileged background. They were either connected to someone important, or they were just rich enough to pay for an army. But for those who are lacking in means, they will have to rely on something else. Nope, there aren't any fairy godmothers in classic Chinese stories. Usually, they will have to learn kung fu. I have mentioned this in my previous video explaining the cultivation trope. The origin of this trope comes from the ancient Taoist alchemical and meditation practices. Ancient Taoists believe that it is possible to achieve immortality and gain magical powers through these means. And since cultivation exercises is closely tied with martial arts and shared a lot of the same principles, martial arts masters are often depicted to have near magical powers. Thus, it serves as a culturally acceptable excuse for the existence of women warriors in Chinese narratives. What? A woman beat a man in a fight? That's impossible. But she learned kung fu. Oh, okay, that makes sense. In European narratives, there are also powerful women like Morgan Le Fay and Joan of Arc. But usually, their powers were attributed to either mystical or external source, such as the devil for witches and god for Joan. Cultivation and martial arts is just a culturally specific narrative that worked for China. And since martial arts is widely available, it normalized the image of the warrior woman, making them a staple in fiction. Even though there aren't many women who were historically recorded to be great individual fighters, like the Maiden of Yue, there are plenty of them in fiction. In short stories of the Tang Dynasty, there was Nie Yinyang, who became an assassin under the tutelage of a nun. Ku Sanyang from the classic novel Water Margin. And the Nu Xia is a mainstay in Wu Xia novels. Even the Wu Xia motion picture that started the Wu Xia movie boom in 1920s, the burning of the Red Lotus Temple, had female leads. The thing about martial arts is that the skill comes with the assumption that the practitioner had to put in a great deal of work. 
they had to work as hard as the men. Making this narrative easier to swallow was the fact that in theatrical performances and even in classic action movies, the actresses were held to the same standard as male action stars. Cynthia Rothrock, the 80s American martial artist star, also had to do bone-breaking stunts when she worked in Hong Kong. But when she returned to the States, they underutilized her and gave her unchallenging action sequences. So, how about Mulan? In which side does she belong? Commander or martial artist? If we were to go by the Ballad of Mulan, the oldest written material about her, which was dated to the Northern Wei dynasty, she's kinda… nicer. She did not have a privileged background, nor did she learn any special martial arts skill. All she did was endure a 12 years long campaign, together with the men, her comrades, which was even more incredible, given that grit and hard work was all the power that she had. The original ballad ends with the question, the male hair wildly kicks its feet, the female hair has shifty eyes, meaning that there are physiological differences between the sexes. But when a pair of hair runs side by side, who can distinguish whether in fact I am male or female? However, in Disney's disastrous live-action movie, she was a gifted child with higher amount of chi than anything else, which goes completely against the essence of the ballad. In the original context, she was special exactly because she was not. To be fair, the story of Mulan was rewritten many times over the millennia. It helps that the ballad was pretty short, so other writers could expand on it and fill in the gap. In the 16th century, it was expanded and adapted into a play by the playwright Xu Wei, and that's how she received the surname Hua. In the later adaptations, during the Qing Dynasty, some works even changed the focus to nationalism. The reason why Mulan's narrative is so captivating is exactly because she was supposed to be the every woman. She did not study supernatural martial arts skill, and neither was she given the command of an army by a relative. So her heroism represented something every woman should strive to achieve. Women and men should be judged according to their ability and merit. Just to be clear, even though warrior women was a common trope in the collective imagination of ancient China, all the way up to the present, it did not mean that women faced no discrimination. In ancient China, up to the last century, they were treated as less desirable than men. They had their feet bound by their mothers because of some viral belief that it will improve their prospect for marriage. But tragically, adding insult to injury, recent studies could not find any correlation that foot binding actually improved their marriage prospect. So they might have been put through all that pain for nothing. Luckily for them, things started to get better after the fall of the last dynasty. Obviously, it is hard to expect them to do the same amount of work if they were not given the chance to. Anyway, if you like this kind of cool history, then be sure to subscribe to the channel. Before I go, I would also like to thank all our patrons on Patreon for supporting us. Until next time, stay cool my bros.